study on tonight. Our scripture will come from Psalm number 34. Psalm number 34. Starting at verse number 1, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And let's skip down to verse number 8, and it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And our song for tonight is, Somewhere Listening for My Name.
is such an awesome and such an amazing God. He blessed us one more time together in his name, and we are appreciative of it. We thank him for who he is. We serve the Almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. We serve the Almighty God. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through verses 4 through 14. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 14 is where we are tonight. We will, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 3. Verses 4 through 14. I knew it didn't look right, didn't sound right. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. Somebody should have corrected me. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. Uh, Sister Davis is going to begin. We're on page 57 in our Experience in God book. And that, that particular passage is where she will be reading. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 4 through 14. And uh, in the book it says, Paul had to overcome his difficult personal history. Here was his approach to dealing with his past and present. Verse number 4 says, If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Verse seven, but everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as done, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Verse 10, my goal is to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to make take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 4 through 14. Thank you. When we, look at, when we look at this uh, particular pericope, we will find the Apostle Paul's anthem and his goal. This is one of my favorite scriptures, and when I look at this passage, the Apostle Paul first began by saying, if anybody got anything to brag about, I do. He says, he says very clearly, if anyone else think they, they have gained confidence of the flesh or from the flesh, I got something to brag about. Brags about his birth, he brags about his nationality, he brags about what tribe he was born to, he brags about the fact that he's a Hebrew among Hebrews, I mean, both his parents were Hebrews, and he brags about the fact that he, he knows the law because he's a Pharisee, and he says he's blameless. He has something to brag about. Last week we ended this particular study by talking about we were created for eternity. We are created for the sole purpose of eternity. Our purpose for creation is not for right now alone. 
Our purpose of being on planet Earth is to glorify God. But our sole purpose is for eternity. I told you last week that the songwriters write, I am living this life so I can live again. I am living this life so I can live again. Because when you're dead, it's not done. When you are dead, you just started a new phase. You just walked into a new arena. You just opened up a new door. Death is a doorway to something greater for the Christian. Death is, death is a, a, a canal that we go through to get to God. As we are here, we go through Jesus to get to God. When we take our last breath, we go through death to get to God. And when we get to God, this temporary stuff down here, we're going to leave it here. We are going to leave all the stuff that we have. It's going to be nothing. The Apostle Paul even goes on to say that everything that I have is just gone. It's just nothing. It's just stuff. Do you know that what you dress in, what you live in, what you ride in, it's just stuff. It has no civic use. It does not lead to salvation. It does not create an eternity for you. It won't even exist in eternity. That's good news. It's good news because stuff that we brag about over here, some of us don't have, and a lot of some people got a lot of it. Some people got a lot of it. Some people got a whole heap of it. But it's nothing compared to what we will have on the other side of death. That's why we can't live our lives like we're living from now on on planet Earth. You got to leave here. All the exercise we do, all the ripping and running we do, all the weightlifting we do, all the cycling we do, it's going to be left here. And we're going to leave here. All the aerobics, all the swimming, all the gymnastics, all these medals that people have won in the Olympics, they are going back to ashes. Go leave here. Is that good news or bad news? That's good. That's good? How much of your stuff do you want to give up tonight? Stuff is just stuff. Degrees are just degrees. Education is a mean to success down here. Everybody ought to get an education. Everybody needs some kind of education. A certificate, they need a certification, they need a degree of some kind, they need some kind of, of association or be a part of some association. Everybody needs something, even if it's just community education. Everybody needs something. But it's only good for now here. You can't take it with you. It has been said several times. You never see a U-Haul falling in a casket or falling in a hearse. We gotta beat this stuff. We, we gotta, gotta get rid of it. And if we don't get rid of it, it's gonna get gotten rid of it. How many of you know people that still, even in the 20th century and the 21st century, that either they used to or they they presently, they cover up all their stuff. Can't sit on that couch without sweating on the plastic. They don't do that anymore. People don't do that anymore. I guarantee you folks do that. Not at 55. How many people have China cabinets for decoration in it? And in that China cabinet, you have plates and forks and knives that no one can eat on. This stuff. All the time, that's what my mom and my sister tell them. When you walk in their house, this looks like a museum. 
I go in the house and before I get in the bed, I take pictures of the bed so I can put everything back the way it was before I got there. Yeah. I mean, it is beautiful. It looks like a museum. It looks like nobody lives there. In every room has its own theme. It may be green here, maybe blue here. It may have an antique thing. Every room has its own thing. But now I walk in the room taking pictures. Because every time I go, it's a different thing. And the pillows are in a different place. And the table is, is fixed up on the bed. Literally. Plates. Forks. Knives. It is set up for two people to eat on. <laughs> it literally, both houses look like a museum. I'm like, wow. Tell my sister, that's your mama, because y'all do things just alike. But all that stuff, don't be left behind. Because it's just stuff. I mean, I get, I get a thrill out of it. I, I walk, before I walk in the door, I wonder which theme I'm going to see in the middle bedroom. Mm. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. I mean, man, it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. They don't mind you sleeping in there. They'll fix it up when you leave. But guess what? It is such a museum-looking atmosphere. Mm. But at the end of the day, mm. Brother Whitlock is just stuff. Just stuff. And it's going to fade away. It's going to rust. It's going to rot. It's going to fade away. But the good thing about God, he has presented us with the opportunity to live eternally. God wants us to live from now on. And he wants us to live with him. And the best way to have a pleasant life on planet Earth is to involve yourself in a loving relationship with him. At the top of page 57, this preacher tells a story about when he went to speak at a conference. He talked about the fact that there was a woman there and she approached him and she began to testify that she didn't know who, who her father was. He abandoned her. They hadn't really spent any time together. And she spent a lifetime looking for her father. And all of a sudden, she found him. Where did she find him? In the back of his experience in God's book. In the back of his experience in God's book. On pages 268 and 269, she says this was she found her father. Now, when I first read this, you know what I was thinking, Sister Whitlock? I said, now, did she find her father? Read the back of this book. <laughs> did she find her father uh, in, a, in a conference for experiencing God? But when I turn to the back of the book, pages 268 and 269, it gives descriptions of who God is. Mm -hmm. Two full pages mm -hmm. of who God is. Then I continue to read, and it says that she met her heavenly father as she was reading from the back of the book. Mm -hmm. A faithful God, the creator of heaven and earth, king of glory, the living, the true God, the Lord Almighty, our leader, our rock of salvation, the eternal God. She went on to read and she says he is the true light. He's the Holy Spirit and he's the Son. What, what her point is, is that if you really, really, really feel worthless, if you feel like you are no good, if you feel like you got to prove to somebody else who you are, just look and find out who God is. When you have a loving relationship with God, when you allow God to saturate your heart and you discover who he is, then you understand that you're really worthy of what God is doing in your life. Now, we are not worthy of our salvation. We are not worthy to live from now on. But Jesus has paid the price for us, and he makes us who we are. 
He makes us worthy. By ourselves, we're not worthy. We can never be worthy. But through God, we are worthy when we find a loving, cononia relationship with him. What's cononia? Cononia, 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 cononia. Poor pages of turning. We went over this word, right? What is cononia? Cononia, yes ma'am. Intimacy. Intimacy. Intimacy with God. Intimacy with people. Cononia. It is complete fellowship with God. How many of you have been praying and somebody interrupted you? Gavin? How many of y'all pray? <laughs> Anybody in the room? I remember a guy came down the aisle one time at the Holy Spirit Church and, and he, he was praying and he was down on his knees praying and, and, and he was asking God for a job and the phone rang. Pastor John said, I hope you got up and answered it. <laughs> the phone rang and sure enough, enough, God was answering his call. And God, it was a call from an employer. Won't ever be an employee. Even in the midst of it, in the midst of your prayer time, God can, God is able to answer your call to Him, and so we certainly are called unto Him on a regular basis. So this woman wanted to find her daddy, show so she could show him and prove to him that she is not worthless. She wanted to prove to him that. She is worth her time, and he should not have abandoned her. But God has proven to be a father to the homeless, and a father to the fatherless, a mother to the motherless. He's God. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul says that I got ground for bragging. He said, he says, if, if any of you have grounds for confidence in the flesh, let me tell you who I really am. I have more reason to brag than you do. Sounds kind of arrogant, yes? Kind of, sounds kind of stuck on himself. But he goes on to say that I've had some difficult history. But on the grounds of bragging in the flesh, I've been circumcised the eighth day. So the first thing he brags about is his circumcision. Circumcised on the eighth day. Why would he be circumcised on the eighth day? And why is that something to brag about? Can you? Part of the law that they would be circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcised on the eighth day. So he, he covers that. Then he says, I'm of the nation of Israel. Why is that important? Israel, God's chosen people, I'm, I'm one of God's people. He goes on to say, not only am I of God's chosen, I am from the tribe of Benjamin. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was the youngest of Jacob's children, Jacob's sons. He was the youngest son. He was a dynamic fighter. He knew warfare. He was a champion in fighting. During the tribe of Benjamin, the first king of Israel was the one who came out of it. His name was Saul. He was of the, the nation of Judah, Benjamin, Benjamin. When there was a separation of the Israelites, the, 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 Jewish, the Jewish nation separation, you have Judah and Israel. He goes on to say, I'm a Hebrew. He talks about his birth. It's important to know that you're born and where you're born. A few years ago, 2006, all the way up to 2009, uh, President Obama was questioned about his birth, and he needed to bring a birth certificate. 
So where you're born and who you're born to, I'm a Hebrew among Hebrews. Both my parents are Hebrew. Then he talks about the fact that I know the law, and because I know the law, I am classified as a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee, so I know the law. So you know, I got something to brag about. Then he goes on to say, not only do I know the law, when it comes to being righteous, I am blameless. Even though I kill Christians, I got my life together. What it says to us today is, regardless of where you have been, regardless of what you have done, God can turn life around for you. God can do some things for you that you can't do for yourself. God has a way of turning things around for you. God can and God will do. And since we hear Paul saying, yeah, I know I, I committed crimes, but I thought I was right. But everything that I have gained, everything that has been given to me, everything that I've done, every move that I make, I consider it lost because of Christ. The Apostle Paul says, look, I believe that Christ is more important than all these things. And Christ is more important than all these things, and because he's more important than all these things, I'm willing to give it up, and I gave it up. The question today is, are you willing to give up everything for the sake of Christ? He says, all oh, this is just lost for me because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, I consider it, I consider it worthy. It's good news. It's good news because Christ is the one that we look up to because he died for us. He voluntarily gave his life for us. Paul goes on to say, because of him, I have suffered loss of all things. Because I've chosen Christ, because I've decided to follow Christ, I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, I've been almost killed because of my commitment to Christ. Do you know that there are some people who have committed their lives to Christ that are being killed even right now? That are being tortured right now? Even during these biblical days, they would play sport with those who were Christians. They would tie animals to their limbs and then let them split the person until they die. They would catch a woman who's expecting, who is pregnant, lay her flat, tie her down in the middle of the arena and let the animals bite her bubble out for the cause of Christ. Because she and he would not denounce Christ. Paul says that I lost everything because of Christ. But he says, even though I'm suffering, and you know the story, even though I suffer for Christ, everything that I had, I consider it dawn. What is dawn? D-U-N-G. What is dawn? Worthless nothing. What is dawn? Say that word, brother Miles. What is dawn? Number two. He said number two. What is dawn? It's poop. What is dawn? It is it is waste. It is specifically animal waste. Paul says all of my accomplishments. I consider it nothing but dumb. It is waste. It is manure. That's the word. Manure. Number two. Poop. Doo-doo. 
It is waste. Yes, waste. That's the name. It is excrete. It is the extra stuff. It is excrement. E X C R E M E N T. E X C R E M E N T. It is waste. He says, I can brag about these things, but even if I brag about them, I consider them lost. It is dumb. So that I may gain Christ. In other words, you got to substitute some things for Christ. In the 70s and the 80s, the, the, there was a big theme out that says, just say no. Just say no. Do you know what they were talking about or what they were talking about? Just say, just say no to drugs. The only problem with this campaign of just saying no, they didn't tell them what to say yes to. In elementary school, in junior high school, and high school, they would have these, what they call now, DARE police officers, D-A-R-E, DARE officers. They would come and they would present everything to the children and they would tell them just say no. We had a drug uh, professor that would come in to our school and we would know him by who he is. Mr. Mr. Pennington, Mr. Cassie Pennington. He would go from elementary school to middle school to high school and he had a boy with all these type of drugs on it that was out during this time. And he would tell children, just say no. He would tell them, this drug will do this to you. This drug will do this to you. And he was doing an excellent job and the campaign was running well, but there was a piece missing. And the piece that was missing is, what do I say yes to? Paul says, you gotta switch out some stuff. All of your education, all of your background, all of your experiences, it is dull. And you got to give it up in order to gain Christ. Let me make myself clear. I'm not saying you got to give these things up in order to, in order to be saved. Because God does great things even before your salvation. But once you are saved and you're committed to Christ, you just got to give some things up. One reason we got to give it up because we have to grow up. Another reason we have to give it up is because we don't want other people to follow us and fail. We want to be good godly examples. Paul says, all this stuff is dull, messed up stuff. So that I can gain Christ. This is what I, I put my, lay my hat. He says, to be found in him. The Apostle Paul says it is our responsibility to be found in Jesus Christ, and the only way to be found in him is to get to know him. We have to be found in Jesus Christ in such a way that we know him and he know us. Here he's talking about the fact that we know him as our Savior, but we have to get to know him as our Lord. We got to get to know him. He says, I want to be found in him not having a righteousness of my own from the law. Remember, in the first few, verse number four, he talked about the fact that, that I have all these credentials, verses four through six. I have all of these credentials. And one of the things that he mentioned is that I know the law. I'm a Pharisee. I know the law. You see, the Pharisees were fair, you see. Unfair, you see. They want to believe that their righteousness was better than anybody else's righteousness. And they wanted you to know, I am fair, you see. And there was nothing fair about them. They were Pharisees. Paul says that I want to know him. I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. We're only righteous because of our faith in Christ. 
When we read uh, Romans chapter 10, the Bible says that God has given to every man a measure of faith. That's why he can say, if you have faith as much as a mustard food seed, you can move a mountain. If you have as much faith as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And the mountain has to skip, jump into the sea. But guess what? Even the faith that we have, we can't grab it. Because Romans chapter 10 says that God has given unto every man a measure of faith. So the faith we have is not our own. The Bible goes on to state that, that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We strengthen our faith. Our faith grows through the word of God. When, when the Bible paints pictures of, of what, has, what has happened and the things that have been done throughout the Bible, it ought to strengthen our faith. And the promises that God gives us as his children ought to strengthen our faith. Our faith ought to be such that every time we hear good news from the word of God, it gives us another encouragement of what God is able to do through us. It ought to boost our faith. It ought to lift our faith. It ought to encourage us. Paul says that not one that, I don't want to do this righteousness from the law. I don't want to talk about the righteousness of the law. But a faith through Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God is based on faith. Apostle Paul says any righteousness we have is because of God. And that righteousness is based on faith. It's centered on faith. Verse 10, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. My goal is to know him. To know who? To, to know Christ. And I want to know him in two ways if I don't know him any other way. I want to know him two ways. What, what's the first way you want to know him? In the righteousness of God based on faith. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Let me tell you, when Jesus got up, there was some power. When a dead man comes back from the dead, it takes power. Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him in such a way that the Holy Spirit can do with me what God has done with Christ. And let me tell you, if you're saved, it took the power of the Holy Spirit to save you. It doesn't matter if you were a good child or not. It takes the power of God's Holy Spirit to save you. He says, I want to know him. And I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. What's the second way you want to know him? In the fellowship of his suffering. Now I just lost half of my audience. But I'm 98%. He says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, and I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. Leave that part to Paul. Because when he says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering, that means that i got to go through some suffering. Jesus has already paid the cost. Jesus has already paid the cost for us so we won't have to die like him, but we have to suffer some things as he did. Paul says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know Jesus in such a way that I realize deep down within that I'm going to have to suffer for some things. It is not a surprise when you suffer for Christ. You ought not be surprised. Your, your suffering for Christ ought to be something that you expect. I'm not going looking for it, but we ought to suffer for Christ's sake. Three mayors ago, one, two, two mayors ago, our mayor said to preachers who are preaching in the pulpit, I want your notes. I want your notes. I want 
these preachers notes. I want your notes because I hear that you're preaching against homosexuality and lesbian activity. I want your notes. She says, I want you to bring your notes so I can evaluate your notes. So she received about 2,000 Bibles and tried to make them make herself look good, tell them we're going to hand them out to people. What the preachers were saying is, these are our notes. We are preaching from the word of God. And since you want our notes, truckloads of Bibles were the delivered to City Hall. <laughs> these are our notes. You would have to suffer for Christ's sake in order to have the fellowship of his suffering. You got to suffer from him. King James said, being made conformed unto his likeness. So we got to suffer being made conformed to his death. You have to be willing to suffer for Christ even for your death. The story is told that the church had about 50 people in it one night and some armed men walked in with long guns. And they say, everybody who believed that Jesus died and rose, everybody who is a Christian, I want you to stand on this wall. Everybody who, he said, before you move, let me finish. Everybody who's not a Christian, stand on this wall. <laughs> and he says, everybody who's a Christian, line up, we're going to shoot you all. <laughs> People began to change where they were standing. <laughs> and out of 50 people, about 10 of them were left. Then the armed men took their masks off. And they said, real preacher, we done ran off about 40 of them. We let them go. Now you got 10 left. These are the only real Christians you got in your church. Mm. My, my, my. 10 out of 50 were left. Mm. You have to be willing to suffer for Christ's sake. If you ask, do, I, do you believe that story about Jesus died? That's just a fairy tale. No, it's not a fairy tale. You have to be willing to stand regardless of what the opportunity of you losing is. You got to be willing to stand for Christ. Paul says, I want to know him in the fellowshipping of his suffering. They asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Thou say it. You got to be willing to accept the punishment even unto death. Assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection and from among the dead. He says, I'm going to one day reach the resurrection. Listen to what he says. First of all, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. And I don't mind knowing him in the fellowship of his suffering. Because one day, I'm looking forward to the resurrection. The Apostle Paul says, this present day suffering is not to be compared to the glory that will be revealed on the other side. And then he says, if I die down here, it's all right. I'm going to wake up up there. That's right. That is so, true. so this present day suffering is not to be compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed on the other side. And then he says, look at what he says. He says, I'm looking forward to the resurrection. You can kill the body down here, but one of these days at the trump of God, at the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise, and I will be a part of the resurrection. Amen. If you let me live, it's all right too, because I'm going to live and represent him well. He said, let me live, I'm going to represent him well. Make me suffer, this is no comparison to the glory that's going to be revealed. He says, if I die, that's all right. I'm going to resurrect whenever resurrection time shows up. I want to know him. Do you want to know him like that? Do, do you want to know 
Jesus in such a way that you can rejoice in the fellowship of his suffering. You can look forward to the day of the resurrection and you want to know him in his resurrection. That's awesome. That, that is just, that's awesome to me. Verse 13. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect. The word perfect means complete. This word Perfect meaning that I've already arrived. He says, I'm not trying to brag about the fact, and I'm not trying to impute to you the fact that I've reached my goal. What he's saying to us is, as long as we live, we got a goal to reach. Every day we wake up, every day we get up, every day the Lord give us one more chance we got to live unto the Lord. It says, it says it right there. I have not already received the goal. King James said, I have not already apprehended. I have not already reached it. He said, but this one thing I do know, but it makes me, I make every effort to take hold of it. We ought to be putting forth an effort every day. To take hold of completion. Take hold of perfection. We ought to be striving every day. I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ. He says, I want to be a part of Jesus Christ in such a way that I can reach my goal. I want to reach my goal. I want to go, I want to reach the goal of perfection. Every day I want to lay hold of Jesus Christ. Every day Jesus Christ has laid hold of me. I want to reach my goal. Verse 13, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I got to forget the things that are behind. Paul says, you can condemn me, but I got to forget the stuff that's behind me. He says, I got to forget what I've done good and what I've done right, and what I've done wrong and what I've done in the past. I got to forget it. See, because we celebrate a long time. I mean, we celebrate. We can celebrate a long time. We can talk about the, the accomplishments we made in Jesus Christ. We can talk about what we've done for God over these last 40, 50 years, and we can brag about it, and we can talk about what we've done lately. Paul said, you forget about that. Remember, that's gone. He says, i got to forget about the things that are behind me and reach forward to what is ahead. You can't celebrate too long. You got, you got work to do. You may take a break to celebrate the great things that God is doing in your ministry and your life, but you got to look forward to those things that are ahead. You may be down and out because something went wrong in your life. You can't hang out with that all your life. Don't let discouragement get you down. You got to look forward to what God has ahead. You got to move forward. You have to make sure that you stop playing the video. Man told Kirk Friend, I watch your video. I know what you are about. Let me tell you, you cannot continue to put the DVD on because it's old and gone. You can't continue to put the 8 track on because it's old and gone. You can't continue to put the cassette nor the CD on because that's old news. And even the things that we have accomplished today, you can't keep playing that stuff over and over. Even the good is bad for us. We can't brag about it because everything we have, God gave it to us. Everywhere we've been, God has taken us. Everywhere we've come back to, God has brought us. And if we're going to go any further, God is going to have to take us. That's right. So we brag on God. We don't brag on stuff. We got to brag on God and God alone. 
reaching forward to what is ahead. He says, verse 14, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. I'm reaching for the prize. I'm keeping my eye on the prize. Keeping my eye on the prize. I'm showing my, showing my, my neighbor how to cut grass. And how to keep a straight line in between the houses. Because one thing about a bad grass cut is when they go in and out. Mm. That's a bad cut. Yeah, that's a bad cut. Mm. So, Bernie, last time you cut your grass, did you go in and out? That's a bad cut, sister. That's a bad cut. So what I was telling her is that what you do, you get lined up to the, to the pole on the fence. You line your lawnmower, either this wheel or that wheel, line one of your lawnmower wheels up to the, to the pole at the end of the fence. I'm going to have to teach Sister Davis that one day. Line. I line my left wheel up to the, to the pole on the fence between my neighbor's yard and my yard. And I don't look down to see where I'm going. I'm looking at the pole. Now that was pretty I'm looking at the pole. I, I don't look down. If, if somebody blow, I wave with this hand and keep pushing toward the pole. Mm -hmm. If something obstructs my way and I have to stop for a moment, I don't stop to look down at where I stop. I look at the pole. I am keeping my eye on the pole. The old folk would say, I'm keeping my eye on the star post in glory. You got to keep your eye on the pole. Keep your eye on Jesus. The Hebrew writer says it like this. He says, he says, looking ever to Jesus, the author and the finisher of, of our faith. Looking ever to Jesus. What he's saying to us, y'all, that there will be some distractions. There will be some things that get our attention. But we got to keep looking to Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Keep looking to Jesus. And once I showed her how to line that lawnmower side up, that front wheel just lining up to the pole. Now when I walk out the house and I said, boy, I'm proud of you. You got that grass looking good now. And her comments are, I had a good teacher. I may not be able to teach a lot of things, Brother Whitlock, but I can teach you how to cut some grass. The Apostle Paul is saying to us, keep your eye on where you're headed, not behind. Yeah. Lot's wife messed around and looked around. She turned into a pillow of salt. But you got to keep your eye on the pole. Keep your eye on Jesus. Keep your eye on the case. Okay, Brother Niles and I are going to finish this particular piece. And uh, we're going to do it together. Question A. He's going to, I'm going to be on page 57. He's going to be on page 58. All right. Question A. What else? Because I know y'all feel this out personally, right? So. Okay. But now let's, let's give them a chance to answer. <laughs> so today is what's A. Read the question and read the answer for us, please. Get the microphone if you would. <laughs> Got some smart students here tonight. They're going to they gonna tell me what they say. It's not what's in the book, but what are some things in Paul's past that could have influenced his present? Paul was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Hebrew born in the tribe of Benjamin. He was a starch uh, Pharisee. Okay, that's A. B. Who uh, wants, who wants that? Anybody wants to answer? B. Okay, keep going, Sister Ben. How did Paul view these things? Verse 8. None of those things mattered. Um, they were not important. They have no value when it comes to knowing Jesus. Okay. C. You why, know okay, go ahead. Why did Paul view his past this way? He had suffered a lot for just knowing Jesus. So Paul wanted to just know Jesus. Okay. How did he want to know him? In the, in the power of his resurrection 
and the fellowship of his stuff indeed. How did Paul, what did Paul do to prepare for a future prize? He forgot the past, what was behind him. He uh, was reaching to what was ahead and pursue as my goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call, eternal life as well. Through Jesus Christ. Okay, Brother Miles, they did that one for us. Okay, who has investing in the future? Investing in the future, and we will close it out. Investing in the future. Huh? I, won't, I won't deny it. <laughs> I would share it. Before you go, Brother Miles, can you read that last paragraph? Last paragraph. Right before investing in the future. Paul's desire was to know Christ and to become like him. You can too order your life under God's direction so you come to know him, love him, and become like Christ. Let your presence be molded and shaped by what you are becoming in Christ. You were created for eternity. Amen. So you're created, thank you. You're created for eternity. You're not just created for earth, you're created for later on also. Okay. Investing in the future. Invested in the future. Begin orienting your life to God's will. His purpose go far beyond time into eternity. Make sure you're investing your life, time, and resources in things that will last, not in things that will pass away. If you don't recognize that God created you for eternity, you will invest in the wrong priorities. Mm -hmm. You should store up your treasures in heaven. I mean, read Matthew 6, 19, 21, That's what you just read. That's the oh, okay. This is why a love relationship with God is so important. He loves you. He knows what is best for you. Only he can guide you to invest your life in a worthwhile way. This God, guidance will come as, this guidance will come as you walk with him and listen to him. So when we look at it, and I want you to do this assignment, passing away, list the things that are passing away, list the things that are eternal. List those things that are passing away and those things that are eternal. And our summary for tonight, our key start, key thoughts. To be loved by God is the highest relationship, the highest achievement, and the highest position in life. God did not create me for time. He created me for eternity. My, my, my. I will let my presence be molded and shaped by what I am because, because what I am to become in Christ Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I will make sure that I invest in things that are lasting. Only God can guide me to invest my life in worthwhile ways. The door of the church is open. The fact that Jesus died on Calvary, he invested in worthwhile things. He was investing in our eternity. He chose to die. No man took his life. He laid it down for us. He invested in us. And now we have to invest in worthwhile things. Those things that are not fleeing, that are not fading, those things that are not false. None of this stuff. We must invest in things of God. The only way to do that is to be born again. To trust Jesus as your Savior. To believe that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross. They took him off the cross and laid him in a barber tomb. He was dead. After he was dead for three days, he woke up, he got up, he rose. God roused him from the dead. And when God raised Jesus from the dead, he got up early that third day morning. And that same Jesus is available to us today. The only way for you to get to know God and have a loving relationship with him 
is that you are born again. If you never confess Christ as your Savior, you never believe that he's the Son of God and he rose from the dead, would you just bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life? Just repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Now Jesus, come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, you are now born again and you are on your way to heaven. If you receive Jesus tonight in this broadcast, please let us know so we can rejoice with you. And if you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and where Jesus is the main attraction. Please let us know. Thank you for joining us here tonight for Bible study. Join us every Wednesday night at 715 for Bible study. Join us on Sunday morning for Sunday school. And then join us at 10.30 a.m. for worship service. Sunday school at 9 a.m., 10.30 a.m. for our worship service. Thank you again for joining us. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. Thank God for this privilege of giving unto the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. If you want to... If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Amen. Prayer requests Robert We're praying for Brother Robert Miller, the lifting brother Robert Miller in prayer. While we stand to our feet, please remember this Sunday is our Latino, our Latino service. We'll be worshiping God in two languages, of course, and we're going to give honor to the Latino heritage. We will be eating Latino food at the church, so please, ma'am, please, sir, come dress as a Latino. <laughs> and uh, we won't be playing the hollow music or anything, but we will be celebrating the conquering King of Calvary, Jesus Himself. So please, ma'am, please, sir, come and be a part, and we will fellowship by eating food afterwards. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we honor you. We praise you. We, we bless your holy name. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us. Bless us as we leave this place. Bless our choir, our musicians to come and sing unto you. Bless us, Lord, that we will be about your business. Lord, we realize that you are making a way for eternity. Bless us to realize that we are walking to prepare for eternity. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you do. Bless us as we go. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are this message.